Welcome to the introductory lecture of the Satellite Engineering course. Well, let's kick off with the introduction. From dreams to technical challenges. It's an outline of the different lectures for the next months. You know that space may us dreams for centuries. Now we are able to put a lot of systems into space and to change our life. To carry out this change, the engineers handled a lot of technical challenges. For the next slides, I will answer to thesis questions. What is a satellite? Why do we want to go into the space? Where is it possible to put a system into space? When did everything start? And who is involved in the space domain? I will finish with a question. How is possible to manage the technical challenges? As a teaser, I would like to share with you some stunning pictures taken in space. Look at the way, the American astronaut moving in space. This kind of activity is called an EVA as no as extravehicular activity, because you are out of the spaceship. The astronaut is able to move, progress into space thanks to MMU as no as manned maneuvering unit, a kind of a chair with propulsion. This astronaut is Bruce M. C. Candless, first human being satellite around the Earth. This picture shows two astronauts working on the building of the ISS International Space Station. Can you imagine the same view from your office? It's not only the USA or Europe and Russia that are hands-on on the space. Our Canadian friends are also very involved in this domain. For instance, they are the designers of the Canadarm. It's a robotic arm which is attached either to the space shuttle or attached to the International Space Station. Speaking of the space shuttle, here is the huge cargo bay of the space shuttle which delivered big satellites into the orbit, for example the Hubble telescope was deployed by the space shuttle. This same space shuttle from the United States for America was... In the 90s the only way for the American astronauts to get into the space and the launch was, you can imagine, such a spectacular moment for the people who had the chance to see that. Do you see the blue circle there? Does anyone have an idea of what it is? It's a water tank. The purpose is that just before the launch and the starting of the engines, a lot of water that comes from the water tank is discharged on the launch pad. But why? The noise produced by the engines is so loud that it could damage either the launch pad or the rocket engines themselves. The water is therefore used as a vibration damper to reduce this noise. The white smoke you see on the right side and the left side of the picture is water steam and not the smoke of the combustion in the engines. As we move to this picture, do you notice anything atypical? We have some sunspots. It's some colder area on the surface of the sun but we have this black spot there. With a zoom, it's what we can see. In the center of the picture it's the ISS moving in front of the sun, and on the left it's the space shuttle approaching the ISS. Of course you have to be quick to take this kind of picture because the passage of the two objects in front on the sun, seen from the ground is a fraction of second. It's a snapshot. Sometimes things don't go as planned. Watch here the launch of a DELTA-2 rocket with a GPS satellite on board. Mission and liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Station of the Air Force Delta-2 launch vehicle carrying the new GPS-2R satellite. We have had an anomaly. We uh, just had an anomaly of the Delta-2 launch vehicle from Cape Canaveral Air Station. We need to secure the area. Once again, we had liftoff of Delta II launch vehicle from Cape Canaveral Air Station, and we just had a problem with the vehicle on the pad.
We finish with this 1 meter resolution satellite image of Manhattan, New York was collected at 11.43 a.m. On Sept. 12, 2001 by Space Imaging's IKONOS satellite. Here, you will discover different satellites. I emphasize on. In green the technical challenges of the mission of the satellite. In red, the design interaction we have in the satellite. And in blue to explain the kind of failures we came across. We begin with Sputnik. The first satellite in space. Sputnik launched in 57 by the Russians. For most of you, if you don't know, it was the Cold War between USA and the CCCP X Russia. The first major success was won by the Russians with a successful launch into orbit of an artificial satellite. You see, Sputnik is a sphere with two antennas. CCCP was trying to act smarter than the USA but anyways, at the bottom of all, it had a scientific goal. The idea was to identify the different layers in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Sputnik performed an outstanding, disruptive breakthrough in spite of several failures before the successful flight. Let's take a look at the technical data of the satellite. Sputnik is a small sphere, kind of 0, 6 meters of diameter and the weight is no more than 84 kgs. The power of the signal emitted by Sputnik is only 1 W. It's the same for your mobile phone. Sputnik didn't need propulsion as soon as it was into orbit, it was not able to change its orbit. No ADCS either. ADCS is the acronym of Attitude Determination and Control System. You'll have a lecture on it in the next weeks. But don't get confused by these two terms. Propulsion is for changing your orbit. ADCS is to change your attitude into orbit. For rotating your satellite or stabilize the rotation of the satellite, for example to place the antenna of the satellite towards the ground. To communicate, Sputnik has two antennas with a spherical radiation pattern. Don't forget this course in just an introduction. You'll be followed by plenty of details in the next lectures. For the orbit, it's the same. Next week you will receive all the knowledges related to orbit. For Sputnik, the orbit was a LEO, low Earth orbit, with the different features. 950 is the apogee, highest altitude of the orbit. 220 is the perigee, lowest altitude, and 65 is the inclination of the orbit. Sputnik was a very small satellite but on the other hand we have the International Space Station or YSS. The ISS is made of an international cooperation, except China. The objective is to perform scientific experiments. The ISS is massive, 470 tons, the size is so huge. 58 by 73 by 28, the size of a football field. Currently we have some astronauts doing experiments and need a lot of power. At peak, you collect up to 110,000 watt thanks to the solar panels. The ISS has a propulsion. Two Svesda engines or the thrusters from the cargo which resupply the ISS with food, water, experiments, astronauts, and many more. What is the use of these thrusters? To answer this question, take a look first at the orbit. The orbit of the ISS is quite circular because you have the apogee which is nearer than the perigee. But mainly, the altitude is very low. The limit of the space is established at 100 km but 350 km is very low anyway. So what? In low orbit, the atmosphere is very thin but you are not in a full vacuum. So you still have an atmospheric drag that decreases slowly the speed of the ISS and then the altitude. Therefore, we need to rise up periodically the orbit of the ISS thanks to the thrusters. You can see here are the technical data. The ISS has of course an attitude determination and control system. It works with gyroscope, small thrusters, star trackers, sun sensors, GPS and many more. The HST. 
This is the Hubble Space Telescope, the famous one. It was the origin of the revolution of the astronomy, with beautiful pictures of stars, constellations, nebula, and galaxies. It was launched with the Space Shuttle in 1990. As you can see, the pointing accuracy of the optics is very less than one arc second. But, at the beginning, the telescope just sent fuzzy pictures, because there was a defect on the primary mirror. The NASA sent two missions, with the Space Shuttle, to make a hardware upgrade of the telescope. It's still in orbit and sending beautiful pictures, and creating sciences to understand the universe. In 2021 or 2022, the USA will launch with a European rocket the successor of this telescope. It will be the James Webb Telescope. The technical challenge in this case was to put 11 tons in orbit. The only solution at that time was the space shuttle with its cargo bay. The weight is heavy as the size is large. You need more than 4 kilowatt to use the telescope and you can imagine the complexity of the ADCS as the requirements of the pointing accuracy reach less than 1 arc second. To communicate you have to send to the ground pictures, so the rate of the communication has to be higher, that's why you need to have bigger antennas. Here is illustration of the next space telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope. Do you know the difference between a probe and a satellite? A satellite orbits the Earth, and a probe is made to travel in the solar system to visit the different planets, or the Sun, or the asteroids. Let's go far beyond with the Voyager probe. This probe was launched far before your birth. In 1977, Voyager traveled to Jupiter, then Saturn, and Uranus, and then Neptune. It was the first human object reaching Uranus and Neptune. So, it was the first time we received some pictures of Theses' two planets. As you can see on this picture, it needed 12 years in between the launch and the arrival near Neptune. The planetary alignment occurs only every 176 years. So you have to be ready for launch as planned. This distance in this case is about 10 exponent 9 kilometers that means 10 billion kilometer and you have just a 23 watt for your transceiver just as much as an old radio. Do you have any idea of the size of the ground antenna which is able to decode the signals coming from the probe? Concerning the technical data, take a look at the power needed to perform the mission. We need 470 watt but we are very far from the sun. So it's impossible to collect enough energy with solar's panels. The only possibility, even today, is to use a RTG, as known as, radioisotopic generator. It's not a nuclear reactor because you don't have any fission or fusion. But we still have nuclear elements producing electricity with the heating of thermocouples. No real orbit in this case. We are flying towards the outer planets. More recently, the European probe Mars Express was launched in 2003 with, as objective, to explore Mars with a 40 meters resolution radar. The idea was to measure the distribution of water into the ground of Mars. You had two parts in Mars Express. The first one is the orbiter, and the second one is the Beagle 2 lander. As soon as the probe is in orbit of Mars, the lander was jettisoned onto the orbit doing the atmospheric re-entry and land. But there was a defect in the parachute and Beagle crashed into the ground. At this time, only the USA achieved to land something properly on Mars because it's very difficult. First you have to reach the Mars orbit and then at 50 million kilometers away to manage the re-entry. Lot of attempts, but few successes. Here the parameters of the orbit, 259 km for perigee and 11,560 for the apogee, so your orbit is an ellipse with a big eccentricity. Even it is an European probe, it was launched with the Russian rocket. Soyuz Next satellite I want to share with you it's SOHO. SOHO is solar probe.
It means that it's in orbit around the Sun. The scientific goal of the mission is to observe the Sun and make space weather predictions because the Sun emits a lot of particles and radiation, which change with time. Here is a look at the images coming from SOHO with a huge solar flare. Over Over here, you can see the technical datas of SOHO, but we will skip it. There is a big story being this probe. We lost the contact for a month with the probe. We used a radio telescope to diagnose the satellite. We sent a huge power thanks to the radio telescope to have an echo from SOHO. It confirmed that SOHO was in the good location, but it was spinning with a rate of one round per minute. The recovery team began by allocating the limited electrical power, thawing the frozen hydrazine fuel tank using SOHO's thermal control heaters began thawing pipes and the thrusters was next and SOHO was reoriented towards the sun. After nearly a week the spacecraft recovers its activities. Now, we are down to Liege with OUFDI-1, first 100% Belgian satellite. OUFDI is a nano-satellite. It's a cube with a volume of 1 liter. The objective of OUFDI was to test a brand new digital radio protocol. The second objective was to test new solar cells. OUFDI was entirely designed by students and launched from Kourou in French Guyana thanks to a Soyuz rocket in 2016. Sadly, we lost the contact with the satellite after three weeks. Here is some pictures of the integration of the satellite in the Liege Space Center. Just before the launch you have the integration of the satellite into AP pod which will be attached to the last stage of the rocket. Here you can see the fourth stage of the rocket. Here is the main payload, and there the P pod with OUFDI inside. The picture on the right shows you the liftoff of the rocket. As you can see, the datas are in opposite way of the datas of the ISS. The weight of OUFDI is only 1 kilogram and the power is only 1 watt. No propulsion on board and a simple ADCS made of permanent magnets with hysteric materials. To summarize the seven examples I showed you, all the satellites are different. The heaviest satellite is several tons while the smallest weighs only a few kilograms. As you have seen, OUFDI-1 was a small cube with edge of 10 centimeters and we can see satellite with a size more than 10 meters. Of course, a small satellite works with a fraction of watt than a bigger satellite for the telecommunications can use several thousands of watts. You can see a lot of different frequency bands used for the telecommunication. A lot of options for the ADCS, many styles of orbits, are all with specify features and a lot of choice of rockets to send your satellite in space. I hope you will have a quite clear view of all at the end of the different lectures. I want to come back to the failures and explain to you one of the most well-known. It was for the Mars Climate Orbiter. There was a navigation error for the atmospheric re-entry. The NASA did all the specifications in metric units, as meter kilogram. Lockheed Martin used the imperial units as miles and so on. So there was an error between the electronics and the software because both of them didn't use the same units. The results came to a later opening of the parachute and then to a land crash on Mars. Maybe, you are overconfident of the design of your satellite, but the rocketry is an art. With some success and some failures. Look at this chart. In blue the success launch and in red the failures. Even now you have disasters. One example in 2019 happened with the Vega rocket designed in Europe. One of the stages of the rocket didn't work well and the satellite burnt in the atmosphere. The first question at this time is, what is a satellite?
A satellite is just an element within a large system. First, you need to launch your satellite. And a lot of constraints and requirements comes from the launch vehicles. By instance, the size of your satellite, the weight of course the launch site, the orbit and the vibration your satellite must bear. After the launch, your satellite is working on its orbit and you have to get in touch with it. So you need an antenna on the ground. We call it the ground station. You can send telecommand TC and receive the datas from the satellite. We speak of TC, TM. According to the types of communications needed, you must use the right ground stations. Let me show you two different examples. First, in Redu in Belgium, we use small antennas for the Galileo constellation. Another example, here we have the DSN, Deep Space Network. It uses three huge antennas of 70 meters of diameters located in Goldstone, Madrid and Canberra. Each antenna covers an angle of 120 degrees. Thus any probes anywhere in space can be in the linear sight of one of the three antennas. What is in a satellite? You have two main parts. The payload in violet is the part of the satellite which is the motivation of the mission. For example, this probe is Voyager 1 or 2 and the main scientific objective was to measure the magnetic field in space with this part. Another scientific goal was to take some pictures, so here use some scientific instruments. To perform this you need some parts for the power, a main computer, a transceiver with an antenna and a pointing system. All of these subsystems is called the bus or the platform. Take a look at these instruments of Voyager 1 and 2. We have, for the payloads, different cameras, magnetometers, cosmic ray detector, plasma detector, photopolarimeter and UV and infrared spectrometers. So, as I said the bus or platform is a complex assembly of different subsystems. Structure and mechanism to withstand the launch and to maybe deploy or run mechanisms. A propulsion for maneuvers and trajectory. A thermal control to survive to the harsh space environment. Telecommunications to exchange with the ground. Attitude control system to ensure a correct orientation in space. Power subsystem to manage the power, solars, panels and batteries. And last but not least the onboard computer which is the brain of the satellite. Take a look at the Voyager probe. For the telecommunication subsystem, you have two antennas. One with a high again, for the higher data rate. And one with a low again, for the low data rate. One part of the ADCS subsystem is the sun sensor. You can see it on the dish of the antenna here. On the very top of the probe, you can find the RTG, radioisotopic thermal generator, which provide the power to the satellite. The RTG is outside the frame of the satellite to be as far as possible of the other parts. The idea is to avoid the perturbations coming from the RTG. The structure of the satellite is right here and is made of a decagon of about 1.8 meters of diameter. Here are the thrusters powered by N2H4 hydrazine. For the thermal control you have some louvers to control the temperature inside the satellite. Of course, you can find some mechanism. This one is for the deployment of the magnetometer. On the frame of the satellite, you can find the star tracker, which is a part of the ADCS subsystem. Here is a very important picture, which summarizes all we said before. For a space mission, we have three parts. First, the satellite, called the space segment. The ground segment on the left is the ground station which is on Earth and which performs the DCTM and the launch vehicle to place the spaceship into orbit. Within the space segment, here is a simplified block diagram of a satellite with the two main parts, the payload and the bus. For the bus, you'll have all the subsystems I listed before. The next question that we want to answer is, 
when starts the space race. On the next lecture, you will receive Mr. Theo Parad will tell you, with all his passion of the history of the astronautics. Imagine that you have your satellite, where can you or should you place it? We see here a representation of the solar system. You can of course put your satellite around the Earth, and moreover the majority of satellites are in Earth orbit. However, there are many other planets where your spaceship can go. The constraints that the satellite will undergo depend on the place where it will be, and these constraints can vary extremely. For example, the magnetic field undergone by the satellite can be huge if you are close to Jupiter or almost zero if you are close to Mars which does not have a magnetic field. If you are near to the Sun, the heat received by your satellite is huge and you must therefore develop a very complex thermal design. If you are far from the Sun, you have problems because you have less energy from the Sun. Other variable criteria can also come from the type of vehicle, the type of communication required, and many more. All this kind of different features are a guide for the design of the satellite. Next week, you will receive a lecture on the different types of orbit. But I would like to show you a very particular example. These are the Lagrange's point. Maybe you have already seen this in physics. There are five points in space where there is a gravitational balance in the Earth-Sun system. That means an object place there does not move relative to the Earth. It is for example at point L2 that we place the big space telescope at 1,500,000 kilometers. But why? Because at this point, we do not have the infrared radiation coming from the Earth which risks to parasitize your payload. Let's go back near to the Earth. We have families for the orbits. First we begin with the LEO orbits. It means low Earth orbit, from 100 km, which is the official limit for space, to 2000 km. For the moment we can found the majority of satellites within this range. You will find after the Mayo orbits. Medium Earth orbit. From 2000 km to 20,000 km. This area fits well for the constellation of satellites. For example for the GPS or Galileo constellation. A constellation is an orbit or several orbits with several satellites placed on it and all the satellites are working for the same system. For example, for the GPS, you have more than 30 satellites. Just above, we can find the geo orbit, geostationary orbit. At 36,000 kilometers. That means that a satellite on this kind of orbit takes 24 hours to make a round. Thus, as seen from the ground, the satellite appears to be fixed. That's why we place all the big satellites for telecommunications. Above 36,000 km, it's the HEO orbit. High Earth orbit. All the examples on this slide in black ISS spot 5 have quite circular orbits. But we can find elliptic orbits as well. For example the first version of the orbit of OUFDI-1 was Higley elliptic. But, as you can see, we have a gap here. Few satellites are in this era. But why? Because in this area, we have the Van Allen belts. The physicist, not the musician. The Van Allen belts are a zone where you can find a lot of charged particles that could damage your spacecraft. The root cause comes from the radiation and particles ejected by the sun, they are deflected by the magnetic field and trapped into the Van Allen belts. You can find some electrons or protons. The graph on the right show you measurements of the energy of the particles you can find. There is a maximum for the energy of the proton for the radiation belt in pink. And above you can find another radiation belt in blue for the electrons. So, it's a very bad idea because these particles can damage even destroy your spacecraft electronics. In the case you have to cross the radiation's belts. 
It's highly recommended to turn off your electronics or try to be in that area as brief as possible. The big question is, why do we want to go into the space? Why do we want to put some satellites on orbit? There are a lot of reasons. Mainly, the objectives of the satellites are either scientific or for telecommunications purposes. The most classical example is the satellite dedicated for the weather observation. Today, if we know well the weather you will have five days in the future, it's thanks to the weather satellites. They are able to see more than the clouds, of course, it's possible to see the fire, sometimes the pollution or the sandstorms. And they work sometimes in different wavelengths to collect different information. Others satellites used for the Earth observation here. The satellite Jason measures the surface of the ocean with an accuracy of 3 to 3 centimeters. Envy sat one of the biggest satellite size of a bus 26 by 10 by 5 meter has a lot of sensors to measures a lot of parameters of the earth land water ice atmosphere of course you are not always in the civilian sector the militaries have also their satellites they are looking the earth but not the same things as the civilian satellites do the satellite KEH-13 has an accuracy of 1 cm in the visible domain. You can't hide anywhere. For the communication, we have all the geostationary satellites as Utilsat is. It can emit more than 2,500 television channels and up to 1,000 radio stations. A very well-known name is Iridium. It's a constellation of 66 satellites dedicated for the communications. If you have an Iridium phone, you can call anywhere on Earth, even if you are lost in the Pacific Ocean. It's the ultimate way to communicate. But it's very expensive and you have a lag of the communications because you have the time of flight of the radio wave from ground to space, from satellite to others' satellites maybe. Plus from satellite to ground and then to you. It's not necessary to introduce the GPS. Global Positioning System. 31 satellites placed on 6 orbitals planes equally spaced in their ascending node location. On of the next lecture Chen will provide to you the meaning of the ascending node signification. But there is a representation of the different orbital planes of the GPS constellation. You can see here what it means with the picture. You can see there an orbital plane with some satellites. And there another one. So anywhere you are on Earth, you can see more than one satellite. It's what we mean by constellation. I spoke about GPS but W in Europe have our constellation pretty operational. It's the Galileo system. We have more than thousands of probes and satellites launched into the space since Sputnik. Some examples here. Cassini Huygens around Saturn. Soho looking for the Sun, Galileo around Jupiter and also asteroid encounters with near Shoemaker probe. The different payloads are always different and depend on the wavelength you need. It's not always an optic payload in the visible domain. The XMM Newton satellite works, for example, in the X-ray dome eye. So the payload design is totally different. On the same satellite, there is more than one payload or sensor. For the mission Galileo, we have more than 10 different instruments. Each instrument's designed by a different team. You can imagine the work of the system engineers. For the bravest, we have space stations. The Mir space station was the first real space station and designed by the Russians. The objective was to perform science with microgravity. Mir was orbited in 2001. Now we have the ISS and we have all the time some astronauts, five or six, working on it. Here is a stunning project from Bigelow Aerospace. You know that it's complicated and expensive to design a space laboratory. You need to have a very safe design and the weight is so important that you need a lot of money to send it into the space. Bigelow wanted to change this paradigm in building some inflated structure as you can see on the pictures. 
Now, in 2019, Bigelow has already sent a prototype attached to the ISS and already inflated. It was just a prototype to check if the kind of structures presents some leaks for a long time. For now, the test is successful and we can hope that, in a near future, we can see the kind of Jantic with light structure. And why not for an inflatable hotel? The sky is the limit. Who is involved in the space activities? You know that we have two major key players for space. Russia. And America. You have a list of the companies working for the space as NASA of course, or the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, designers of the American probes. Lockheed Martin. Also known for the design of the F-35. Northrop Grumman and Boeing, for the most known companies. Russia has two big companies. Roscosmos for satellites. And Energy are for the rockets. The third key player in space race is the Europe. Maybe you already know this name of companies. CNEs in France. DLR for the Germany. ASI for the Italy. EADS. Arian Space, Thales and so on. We have two emerging countries for the space race. First the India, very active for the moment around the moon for example with their probe Chadrayan. And of course China is on the track. And maybe you don't know, but in 2018, China launched more rockets than USA and Russia. And what is going on in Belgium? If you want to work in space-related fields after you studies and stay in Belgium, you have the choice. Amos. Kegelec. CSL, Liege Space Center. Euroheat Pipes. Gillim in Liege. Ionic Software. Lambda X. Sabka. Samtech. Sanaka. Space Bull. Safran Aero Booster. ETCA in Charleroi. Verhart. Vitrasisit. And many more. Some companies listed here are at less than one kilometer from the place we are. Liege is a pearl for the space. Here you can find the URL of the Wallonia Space website. We have a lot of Belgian equipment into the space. One of the famous projects in which the Belgium was involved is the ATV Jules Verne. The ATV is the European cargo ship which resupply the ISS. Many parts of the cargo were designed by Belgian companies. Euro heat pipes for the heat pipes. ETCA for the EPS electrical power system. Space Bull for the software. RIA for the software as well. The ground station in Redu was the backup ground station of the project. And Saffron Aero Booster for the valves of the Eastus engine of the cargo ship. How is it possible to make all these things? What are the technical challenges? The first objective is always the same in engineering. You must satisfy the customer. The customer is the one who pays. At first you have to make the design of the payload which is the ultimate goal of the mission. Just after, you have to do the mission analysis. Which will determine the orbit and the space environment which will put the constraints on your satellite. It gives you many requirements that you use now to design the bus. It shows you the workflow that you'll find for a mission. As you know now, each satellite is different because many missions are one shot. And the design of the satellite is therefore the sum of unique technical challenges. Take a look at this picture. A spacecraft is totally different according your technical background. And each engineer in each domain must be inventive to reach the technical requirements needed. Now I want to show you some examples of challenges encountered by the engineers and then the solutions used. Let's start with the Voyager mission. As I already said, the Voyager probe was designed to make some fly be over Jupiter. Saturn. Uranus. And Neptune. So we are into the deep space, far from the sun dot and thus without energy coming from it. The only possibility we have to generate power is to use nuclear materials. 
but the electronics must survive to the radiation emitted by the nuclear materials, so the engineers had to design an adequate configuration of the bus. And this design is completely different of a classical satellite flying over the Earth. The use of nuclear material could lead to political problems as well. Even it's not technical. The solution of these problems is to make a multidisciplinary design. The objective of the course is that to understand systems engineering and to have a multidisciplinary overview of a problem. Look for the optimal solution for the entire spacecraft. Do not look for the optimal solution for your subsystem. It's the kind of way of thinking used in ESA. The picture shows a CDF concurrent design facility in ESTEC in Netherlands where engineers from all domains can work together. We have a CDF in ESA ready for the CubeSat activities. Second challenge. Each mission is unique. You know now. Where is the satellite going? And what is the mission? So which kind of wavelengths do we deal with? Radio. X-ray. Visible. So you need to fulfill the requirements that it lead to totally different design. To fit the requirements, you must be inventive and sometimes you must design totally new things or concept. For example, for the Hubble Space Telescope, the engineers had to design a way to roll out the solar panels for the launch. The probe Stardust was designed to meet the 81P comet. The probe was following the comet and sometimes went into the queue of the comet. Made of billions of small particles. The difference of velocity between these is particles and the spaceship is up to 18 kilometers per second. So you can imagine the energy received by an impact of the particles even it's small. In that case engineers designed a Whipple shield. It's a kind of several multi-layers shield. Let's finish with Solar Orbiter. As its name recalls, this probe is designed to observe the Sun. So you need to perform it to design some new equipments to observe the Sun while surviving to the heat produced by it. I just have spoken about the heat of the Sun for the Solar Orbiter, but what is the orders of magnitude of the different physical quantities? This picture show you a test performed in the CSL. Here is Liege. You know that in space, it's cold. Very cold. It's obligatory to test your satellite before launch to check if everything is okay. So we have facilities to do it. You put the satellite in a TVAC. Thermal vacuum chamber. Which recreate the same conditions as you have in space. The vacuum and coldness. Take a look at the engineers working. The diameter of the TVAC is 5 meters. The Planck satellite was qualified in Liege. But what was the lowest temperature for this test? It was 0, 1 K. Another order of magnitude was the power of the signal received on Earth by the Voyager probe. 10 exponent in minus 16 watt. Because the probe is at more than 15 billions of kilometers. Another example is the pointing accuracy of the optics of the Hubble Space Telescope. 0 0.007 arc second. Hubble received, in orbit, some hardware upgrade. One of them was the replacements of the solar panels because they produced some vibrations during the passage from sun to shadow and these vibrations reduced the pointing accuracy. For the next challenge, let's speak about their Jupiter probe called Galileo. It had to perform an atmospheric re-entry in Jupiter. In less than two minutes the probe drops its speed from 171,000 km per hour to 1,600 km per hour. The friction of the atmosphere of Jupiter on the spacecraft leads to a shoot of the temperature. Almost reaching 3,900 degrees. No materials can reach this temperature while keeping its mechanical parameters. So the engineers had to design something out of the box. And it's an ablative heat shield. This is the simulation of the thickness of the heat shield. 
on the left where I am pinpointing. The thickness is 14 6 cm before re-entry. And on the right the illustration shows that the thickness is only 10 cm after re-entry. To continue with the order or magnitude. Let's focus on the rocket now and especially on the Saturn V rocket. That one which sent the astronauts to the moon. Saturn V is more powerful than 160 million horsepower about 120 billion of watts. It's a question of power over here. Let's compare the Saturn V rocket with some quantities. The challenges are everywhere in the space domain. The VAB. Vehicle Assembly Building. In the KSC. Kennedy Space Center. Has a volume higher than 3.5 times the volume of the Empire State Building. The picture on the right show you the crawler. It's a motorized vehicle designed to carry the space shuttle. With the central core and boosters from the VAB to the launch pad. It's the largest self-powered land vehicle in the world. 355 liters per kilometer. When you see the orders of magnitude. You have only one solution. You must be creative. You have just only a small fraction of what for the telecommunications. Just design bigger antennas. 70 meters for that one. You only have 15 watt per square meter of power from your solar panels because you are far from the sun. In Earth orbit. You have 1356 watt per square meter. You have to design an RTG with nuclear materials. Take a look at the next challenge. You have others severe constraints. 1. The planning. For the Voyager probe, you just have one alignment of the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Every 176 years. So you have a tight window to launch your probe. If not, you have to come 176 years later. 2. Another challenge is the weight of your satellite. It costs about 25,000 euros per kilogram to send. So you need to reduce the weight of your spaceship while keeping the requirements. 3. You don't have fuel or a lot of power even with solar panels so your spaceship has to save the energy and minimize the consumption. Again, for all these reasons, the engineers must to be creative. If the volume is limited for the launch because the size of the fairing, you must design some deployable elements. As we have within the Voyager probe, let me show you the deployable boom, which is rolled up into the spaceship for the launch and deployed in orbit. Not enough fuel to reach the right speed. It's always possible to play with the physics and to rise your speed. Thanks to a gravitational assistance. In two words, thanks to the conservation of the angular momentum, your probe catches small quantities of the energy of a massive planet and increases its speed. Fifth challenge. As I said before, the environment is harsh. You will find cold temperature, hot temperature if you are near of the sun. If you want to reach the outer's planet, you have to go through the meteoroids' fields. You can receive some cosmic ray able to damage your electronics. All your spaceship is in the vacuum and thus, you don't have convection. You can be exposed to a huge magnetic field. And so on. So, now you know, it's not the easiest environment to place an equipment but you don't have other choices. The solution is to be inventive again and you must develop new technologies as the Whipple shield I mentioned before or thermal blanket to protect your spaceship from severe cold. And the next, last and worst challenge, is that in space, it's impossible to do maintenance, except for unusual examples. As soon the spaceship is in the rocket, it's too late. And I repeat you'll be in a harsh environment, and you have severe constraints. So you can be sure that one part of your equipment can have troubles during your mission. The only way to succeed is to have redundancy. For the Voyager probe, 
Not only one RTG, but three, two byte thrusters, two transceivers, two onboard computer and two magnetometers. And the ultimate redundancy is to send two identical probes instead of only one. As NASA had done with the Voyager probe. So even there was a disaster with one. The second could do the job. It's a philosophy sometimes practiced by NASA. And they did it again with the Vikings Marsha landers in the 70s and with the Opportunity Martian rovers. To summarize this introduction, operative, you can find the paradigm in the box. Your spaceship is a harsh environment. And you have to be creative. But it's so expensive that maybe you need to use proven technologies. A good way to prevent failures is to make some redundancies. But the weight is very crucial factor due to financial constraints. Some paradoxes and technical conflicts are the order of the day. The resolution of such conflict in a productive manner is precisely the goal of systems engineering.